Hello guys, this is the first, the second series of videos that I'm going to do uh, on preparing about the biology part on the IMAT test and let's going to start, we're going to talk about the cell, this is now this part and today we're going to talk about the membranes actually of the cell. But first let's talk about the cell theory. What does the cell theory state? That the basic unit of structure and function for all living organisms is the cell. Of course, um, to it, it has been added now, 170 years after it was first uh, proposed, that uh, um, Virchow's theory at 1855 that all cells arise from pre existing cells by cell division. Okay, so um, now to talk some introductory stuff. All most animal and plant cells have diameters between 10 and 100 micrometers. Uh, although many, like human red blood cells, have a diameter of only 8 micrometer, it's, it's smaller. Of course, we're going to look at many mm, common characteristics, but according to the role and the function each cell performs, we can see that there is some differences. Okay, first of all, the cell. What is a cell? A cell can be thought of as a bag in which the chemistry of life is allowed to occur. Parcels separated from the environment are charged the cell by a membrane. The thin membrane which surrounds all cells here, you see it's that blue part, um, is essential in controlling exchange between the cell and its environment. It is a very effective barrier but also allows a controlled traffic of materials across it in both directions. The membrane is therefore described as partially permeable. If it were freely permeable, life could not exist, because the chemicals of the cell would simply mix with the surrounding chemicals by diffusion. So there is no need to have a cell. Everything would be like, our body would be a bag of ingredients and nothing could work. So we said that this is selective permeable, the plasma membrane, or, or I'm sorry, as it's called, um, cell surface membrane. It separates the cell from the outside, the intracellular space, from the extracellular space. This is its uh, major function. And it regulates the steady traffic that enters and leaves the cells. That means, according to the plasma membrane, the cell decides which substances can go in or can get out. Okay, now we're going to try to describe the structure of the plasma membrane. In 1972, two scientists Singer and Nicholson used all the available evidence to put forward a hypothesis for membrane structure and they called their model the fluid mosaic model. So what is this? Um, one way to describe the structure of the membrane. This is the model. It describes the structure of the membrane. We know that um, the membrane consists of phospholipid, a phospholipid by layers, plus proteins. Now why it is called fluid mosaic model? It's called fluid because both the phospholipids and pro the proteins can move about by diffusion. Of course they move sideways. The phospholipids move sideways mainly in their own layers. Some of the protein molecules also move about within the phospholipid bilayer like icebergs in the sea. 
others remain fixed to structures inside or outside the cell. Now the word mosaic describes the pattern produced by the scattered protein molecules when the surface of the membrane is viewed from above. Okay. This is what we are going to describe. So in the next uh, in the next slides there are no pictures because we're going to come back to this picture all the time in order to describe it. So first we're going to talk about the phospholipid bilayer. Okay, I will stay here because I want to show you here. We the phospholipid bilayer is um, Um, what is it? It contains the it contains phospholipids, okay, which form in that arrangement. Now the phospholipids have their hairs, the phospholipid hairs, pointing to the outside on the acute medium that surrounds the membrane. This medium is aqueous, it's called like that because it contains water. The word aqueous means water containing. Okay. Now the phospholipid tails point inwards, facing each other and forming a non-polar hydrophobic interior. Interior. Now, some of the phospholipid tails are um, some of the phospholipid tails are saturated and some are unsaturated. The more unsaturated they are, the more fluid the membrane. That means more movement exists in the membrane. This is because the unsaturated fatty acid tails are bent. If you go to the PowerPoint and uh, the presentation when we were talking about the phospholipid structure, you will see that the unsaturated, the double bond, causes a bend on the tail. It's there in the picture. If you go and look at it, you will remember it. Okay, and therefore they fit together more loosely. Also, fluidity is affected by. Okay, let me get you here. By the tail length. The longer the tail, the less fluid the membrane. Okay, now, let's look at cholesterol. Cholesterol, if you remember from the last time I presented to you, is a steroid. Okay, it's a relatively small molecule. Like the phospholipids, it's an amphipathic molecule. That means that it contains both polar and non-polar parts. So it has a hydrophobic head, a polar head, then it has the steroid backbone we described last time which is not important then we have the non-polar hydrocarbon tail okay so they have hydrophobic heads and uh, hydrophilic i'm sorry heads and hydrophobic tails so they fit neatly between the phospholipid molecules with the heads at the membrane surface Cell surface membranes in animal cells contains almost as much cholesterol as phospholipid. Here in this picture you can see the, the cholesterol molecules here. Okay. Here we are. Now, cholesterol is much less common in plant cell membranes and absent from prokaryotes. In these organisms, compounds very similar to cholesterol serve the same function. Now, at low temperatures, cholesterol increases the fluidity of the membrane, preventing it from becoming too rigid. This is because it prevents close packing of the phospholipid tails. The increased fluidity means cells can survive colder temperatures. The interactions of the phospholipid tails with the cholesterol, the cholesterol molecules also helps to stabilize cells at higher temperatures when the membrane could otherwise become too fluid. Cholesterol is also important for the mechanical stability of the membranes, as without it, membranes quickly break and cells burst open. 
the hydrophobic regions of cholesterol molecules help to prevent ions or polar molecules from passing through the membrane. Okay, this is generally important. Now let's move on. There are proteins. Many proteins, we said that the fluid mosaic model says that the plasma membrane comprises of phospholipids and proteins. Proteins are found embedded within the membrane and they are called intrinsic proteins or integral. Let's go here. You see, we've got some integral protein. Or a protein could be found right here. Let me draw one for you. Right, okay. This, if a protein is here, it's called integral because it's on the inside. It's embedded in the membrane. So intrinsic proteins could be found in the inner layer, in the outer layer, or most commonly spanning the whole membrane in which case they are known as transmembrane proteins. Now, in transmembrane proteins, these regions, well, what are these regions? The, the hydrophobic regions, which cross the membrane, are often made up of one or more alpha helical chains. Okay. Okay. Now, intrinsic in proteins have hydrophobic and hydrophilic regions. They stay in the membrane because the hydrophobic regions made from hydrophobic amino acids are next to the hydrophobic fatty acid tails and are repelled by the water environment either side of the membrane. The hydrophilic regions made from the hydrophilic amino acids are repelled by the hydrophobic interior of the membrane and therefore face into the aqueous environment inside or outside the cell or line hydrophilic pores which pass through the membrane. Most of the intrinsic protein molecules float like mobile icebergs in the phospholipid layers, although some are fixed like islands to structures, to structures inside or outside the cell and do not move about. Now there is a second type of protein molecule which is the extrinsic protein or peripheral protein. These are found on the inner or outer surface of the membrane. Many are bound to intrinsic proteins. Okay. Okay. Um, some are held in other ways. For example, by binding to molecules inside or outside the cell or to the phospholipids. All the proteins referred will be integral. Okay, we don't. We won't uh, look into peripheral proteins. Now, many proteins. Let me show you something. Okay, many proteins like this one. You see that blue thing, or many phospholipids like this one. They have what branching carbohydrate chains attached to the side of the molecule which faces the outside of the membrane. So here is the outside because we have those carbohydrate chains. Now, if a, a protein has this chain attached to it, it's called a glycoprotein. If a phospholipid has this attached to it, this short branched carbohydrate chain, it's called a glycoglycolipid. Okay. We've talked about that, we've talked about that, we've talked about that. Yes. Now, what have I talked? Have I not talked about? Um, these um, carbohydrate chains, they project like antenna into the watery fluid surrounding the cell, where they form hydrogen bonds with water molecules and so help to stabilize the membrane structure. Now, these carbohydrate chains form a sugar coating to the cell, which is called glycocalyx. That means what? All those projections together, only the projections, are called glycocalyx, which is what? What we see above the membrane is, is the glycocalyx. Okay. 
Um, the carbohydrate chains help the glycoproteins and glycolipids to act as receptor molecules which bind with particular substances at the cell surface. Here we go. Now. Different cells have different receptors depending on their function. And there are three, one, two, three major groups of, re or of receptors. One group of receptors can be called signaling receptors. Here, signaling receptors. And because they are part of a signal system that coordinates the activities of cells, the receptors recognize messenger molecules like hormones and neurotransmitter. Oh, I'm sorry. Like hormones and neurotransmitter. Okay, what are neurotransmitters? They are chemicals that cross synapses, allowing nerve impulses to pass from one cell to another. We'll see them later, okay? Um, now, when the messenger molecule binds to the receptor, a series of chemical reactions is triggered inside the cell. An example of a signal receptor is the glucagon receptor in liver cells. Cells that do not have glucagon receptors are not affected by glucagon. Now, signaling, we will watch it later in more depth. And I will give you an example in the next lesson. Okay, now I want to make an introduction. The second group of receptors are involved in endocytosis. We will see what it is. I just want you to know that it exists. There is a part that, it, that said that... I'm sorry, that a receptor that is evolved in endocytosis. They bind to molecules that are parts of the structures to be engulfed by the cell surface membrane. I will look at it in this video. Okay, let's move on now. We have the third group, which is involved in binding cells to other cells. Cells adhesion in tissues and organs of animals. Okay, now, some glycolipids and, glycolob and glycoproteins act as cell markers, allowing cell recognition, and they are called antigens. Each type of cell has its own type of antigen, rather like countries have with different flags. This is the antigens. You see, something binds to it. What are antigens? Uh, antigens. antigens are areas of the cell that are recognized by something else. Okay, we will talk about in a later video about the immune system and we will see what, are ant what antigens are. We will talk about the circulatory system. We will see the AB0, ABO, blood group antigens. Okay, they're glycolipids and glycoproteins. So we'll look at those in more detail. I just want you to be familiarized that when you listen to antigens, I want you to Imagine about glycoproteins and glycolipids that are above, you remember, above the cell membranes on the outer surface, therefore allowing to be recognized. Okay, now many proteins act as transport proteins here. We saw that we have different types of proteins. Okay, now let's see what types of proteins we talk. We'll talk about integral membrane proteins, and they act as transport. They provide hydrophilic channels or passageways for ions and polar molecules to pass through the membrane. And there are two types, channel proteins here and carrier proteins here. Now, what I want you to remember is that each transport protein is specific for a particular kind of ion or molecule. Therefore, the types of substances that enter or leave the cell can be controlled. That means, if I'm telling this channel protein, it does not mean that every hydrophilic substance can pass through this. We say that it's um, a sodium channel protein. That means that it's allow it allows it's a, it's a, it acts as a pore for only sodium to, to pass. It's specific for a particular 
ion or molecule. This is really important, you need to know that. Okay, now before I move on to talk about channel proteins, carrier proteins, that kind of stuff, the plasma membrane is has this structure, but this structure is the same in all the membranes, which means what? That, that there are organelles inside the cell that have membranes. It's the same fluid mosaic structure that they follow. Okay. Okay. Let's talk now about channel proteins. We said that there are channel and carrier proteins. What are the differences? Channel proteins are actually pores, like holes, that allow only one substance to pass through them. Okay. Okay. And they are there in order to allow charged substances, usually ions, to diffuse through the membrane. What is diffusion? We will see it in just a bit. But right now I want you to know that they exist and they allow the movement of substances, usually ions. Now most are gated, that means that part of a protein acts like a gate and this part of the protein can move like that and what makes it move? Voltage gated, voltage difference. Ligand gated, that means that something extracellular or intracellular can come here, one substance to bind in this protein and cause it to open its gate. Okay? When I want you to know that they have part that open and close according to some differences. When we do the physiology part in the biology of the IMAN, we will talk about that. Okay? But right now, I want you to have a general idea. Then we've got carrier proteins. These proteins do not have a fixed shape. Okay, you see, they don't have, this is how, what they do. They don't have a fixed shape. But they flip between two shapes. As a result, the binding site is alternately open to one side of the membrane, then the other. If the molecules are moving across the membrane, they will move according to their concentration gradient. It's not like they will move according to... It will be constantly open. It will not do it all the time. Okay, it needs energy most of the times. ATP. Carrier proteins. Okay, now the plasma membrane in the electron microscope has a trilaminar appearance. You see it here? One, two, three layers. That is what tri trilaminar means. Trilaminar. Why? Why three layers? Here. One layer, two layer, three layer. First layer, second layer, third layer. Okay. Now we're going to look into movement of substances into and out of the cell. Before we do that, I want to inform you about some chemical terms we're going to use. Like solvent is the substance that does the dissolving. Sol solute is the substance that dissolves. So if I have a, a glass of water and I throw some sugar in it and the sugar dissolves, the sugar is the solute because it dissolves and the solvent is the water. Hypertonic and hypotonic and isotonic are three ways to describe concentration in regards to something else. So to compare concentrations between two. What is concentration? Now, let me give you the chemical type here. C is concentration equals N 
over V. V for volume and N for the number of moles. This shows us how much of the substance I have. Substance. I'll just write sub here, okay? And this shows us the volume in which the substance exists. That means that if I add water, if I add water, what will happen? The substance will change. No, therefore the, the number of moles n will stay the same. But the V, the, the volume, will increase, will increase. If the volume increases, the, the concentration of the solution will decrease. Okay. Is that clear? Okay. So hypertonic is if I compare two solutions and one has a greater solution than the other, then this one is hypertonic. If it has a less a lower concentration is hypotonic, and if they have the same concentration, they're called isotonic. But now let's see what diffusion is. We talk about it, we listen about it, but we don't know what it is. So this is the, um, the definition of diffusion, but I'm not going to describe it according to this definition. You should read that definition to know it, to have an idea about the chemical language, but I want you to give to, to remember my example. Let's say you are in a small room, like your bedroom, okay? And suddenly I put, I place actually, um, three people. It's okay, nothing happens. Let's say I place ten in your bedroom. Mm. You start to get annoyed, so many people in your bedroom, and now I'm placing a hundred people in your bedroom with the closed doors. What will happen when I open the door? People will move from your bedroom to the, to the area around outside of the bedroom until the number of people inside the bedroom and the number of people outside the bedroom will become about as equal. And that is if the bedroom and the and the outside bedroom has the same area. Okay, so if I open the door, people will start bursting outside like that. You see, I've got water, and I've got a solution here with much, much, much high, a high concentration of solute. What happens if I put a permeable membrane that this substance can pass through? It will go until it has the same concentration in both solutions. That will happen. This is what's diffusion, the movement in order to have the same concentration is called diffusion. Okay, again I want you to imagine that. What is facilitated diffusion? Now let's imagine this example here, and that substance I put in is sodium ions. Okay, the substance here, this is a sodium ion. Can it pass through the permeable membrane? No, because the membrane is not permeable for the sodium. But if I put some carrier or channel proteins in the membrane, therefore the membrane will be permeable to sodium. But the sodium will use this um, channels, the sodium channels, in order to pass through the membrane and diffuse. So it is being facilitated, its diffusion is facilitated by specific carriers. Okay, this is what facilitated diffusion is. Now this is counter current exchange. Um, if you want to obtain some knowledge in depth, read that. I'm not going to talk about that, I will just move forward here. Osmosis, what is osmosis? Osmosis is the diffusion of water molecules. Now, let's say I've got this semi-permeable membrane and 
the sugar molecules are too big to pass through those gaps, through those pores, those channels. So what happens? They can't diffuse. But if water diffuses, that means water moves from here to here, what will happen? They will have the same concentration because, let me explain that to you. Here I've got N, V, and here again N, V. And let's say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and here more than 5. Therefore, this is a great concentration. If water moves from here to here, the volume here will lower. That means the concentration will rise. And here, the volume will get higher, therefore the concentration will decrease. Until the point that we've got what? Equal concentrations. And this will happen. So osmosis is the diffusion of water molecules. When the solute molecules cannot diffuse, water molecules diffuse to ensure equal concentrations. Okay, is it clear? Let's move on now. What is the water potential? It's a number. It's psi. Um, psi, the Greek letter psi, can be used to mean water potential. And we can think it like the tendency of water to move out of a solution. This depends on two factors. How much water the solution contains in relation to solutes and how much pressure is being applied to it. Now water always moves from a region of high water potential to a region of low water potential. That means that water here has a high tendency to escape, lower than here. Here there are many water molecules and each water molecule they don't want the other, therefore they want to escape it. Here they are okay, they've got some sugar, they've got some water, they're okay, therefore they don't have that much of, of need to escape. So because this has a higher need to escape, therefore higher C, higher water potential, the um, movement, the diffusion, the osmosis will happen towards this direction, from lower to higher water potential, from high water potential, I'm sorry, to lower water potential. Okay, if we've got equal water potential, like here, there will be no movement, therefore no osmosis. Now let's see what happens in animal cells. Let's say I have a hypotonic solution and I put inside a red blood cell. What will happen? Red blood cell will start taking water inside because this is the hypotonic solution. This is the hypotonic solution, this is the red blood cell. will start taking water inside until at some point what will happen? It will burst because it will have taken so much water. Now, if I have equal concentration of all the substances, therefore nothing will happen. If I have less concentration, that means 80 in a hypertonic solution, that means this is now the red blood cell, and this is, I'm sorry, this is the red blood cell, and this is the, the blood. Water will go to the blood, and therefore what will stay? This. It will be, it will shrink. Okay, so in order for all our cells to be in the normal phase, we need to have a constant water potential inside the bodies of animals. Now there is active transport. What is active transport? Let's remember again the example I gave you before about the room and all those people inside our bedroom. Now you've got 100 people in the bedroom and you don't have your sister and you really 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 need your sister. Then your mom will open the door and try to push your sister inside. It will need to give much energy because the movement is outside the room but you want to put something inside the room to have it more like your sister therefore what will happen you will need energy and your mom needs to give much 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 energy in order to push your sister inside the room of one the bedroom of 100 people this is called active transport 
which is against its uh, transport, against the concentration gradient. And this is a good example for now to talk about um, the sodium and potassium PEMP. What is that? It's a carrier protein that is used for active transport. Such pumps are found in, cell, in the cell surface membranes of all animal cells. In most cells, they run all the time. Okay, the role of this pump is to pump three sodium ions out of the cell at the same time as allowing two potassium ions into the cell for each ATP molecule used. When you listen ATP, you're going to think energy. ATP energy, ATP energy, okay. The ions are both positively charged, so the net result is that the inside of the cell becomes more negative than the outside. A potential difference is created across the membrane. Okay, um, this is its purpose, actually. I'm not going to look into it more detail because when we do physiology again, I'm going to talk about that in great, great detail. But I want you to know that it's a carrier pump. It's a carrier um, protein, transmembrane protein that uses ATP. Therefore, it does active transport. Now, so far we've been looking at ways in which individual molecules or ion cross membrane. Mechanisms also exist for the bulk transport of large quantities of materials into the cell or out of the cell. Large molecules such as protein or polysaccharides, parts of cells or even whole cells may be transported across the membrane. This requires energy, so it is a form of active transport. Now endocytosis involves the engulfing of the material by the cell surface membrane to form a small sac or endocytic vacuole. And it, take, it takes two forms, phagocytosis and pinocytosis. And exocytosis um, is the reverse of endocytosis and is the process in which materials are removed from cells. Now, in this video, I want to talk about exocytosis because in order to talk about exocytosis, I want to, to talk first about the Golgi apparatus. So, we're going to talk about it in the next video. So, I want you to look at endocytosis. What's happening? We uptake this, the, the, the cell uptakes a whole, a bank, a bulk of solid material. What are these things? Let me show you. What are these things? Do you remember what these things are? Receptors involved in endocytosis, they bind to molecules that are part of the shrunks to be engulfed. So, I want the cell wants to eat, let's say, uh, this thing. This thing has some receptors, has some, a part, this, that is recognized by receptors of, what? Receptors, oh, I'm sorry of my plasma membrane, oh, of my plasma membrane. So it will take that, it will close like that and it will come in. This is now the, phagocy the phagocytic vacuole. Now, there are cells that do specialized these things, okay, that only do phagocytosis. They are called phagocytes and an example is white blood cells that engulf bacteria in order to destroy them. Okay, now pinocytosis, pinocytosis or cell drinking, it's the bulk uptake of liquid. The vacuoles, the vesicles formed, are often extremely small, in which case the process is called micropinocytosis. Now, how cells communicate one with another through all these things? Tight junctions, desmosomes, gap junctions, and plasmodesmata. I want you to know that the first three are only found in um, the first three are only found in animal cells, and the last only in plant cells. 
This is for the cell to communicate and we'll see each one's purpose. But before that, we, why cells communicate? They need to communicate with each other and with their environment. Their environment. They do it in a wide variety of ways. Now I want you to give you an example. Um, simple bacterial cells secrete molecules that enable them to respond to changes in their population density by a phenomenon called quorum sensing. One example is the bacteri bacteria Vibrio fischeri, something like that, which produces a bioluminescent substance, which is called luciferin, that makes the, bacter the bacteria glow. If luciferin were produced by only one single cell, it would not be detected by other animals. By using this mechanism, quorum sensing, it produces luciferin when its population is large enough that its bioluminescence can really be noticed. Okay. Now, first step we, we said is tight junctions. What are they? They are strong connections like that, like belts around the epithelial cells that line organs and serve as a barrier to prevent leakage. Now, epithelial cells, they make up the walls of organs. So let's say I've got the walls of the urinary bladder, which has what? Inside urine. Okay. But urine is, um, is a liquid. It could pass through the small gaps between the cells. But it does not happen because they have got those tight junctions. What is this type junction? You see, this is the membrane of the one cell, the plasma and the plasma membrane of the next cell. They've got all these proteins, the protein complex, they unite their plasma membrane properties. They join them together in order to create those tight junctions in order for liquids not to pass outside or inside. Okay? Therefore, no urine will leak out of the bladder into the surrounding body cavity. There are next desmosomes. They are found in many tissues and have been compared to spot welds that rivet cells together. Like um, screws. Imagine screws. Spot welds is something like that screws that we glue cells together. Why? Because these types of cells, they undergo severe mechanical stress. They are subjected to severe mechanical stress. Like when? The skin epithelium, which we can pull and not tear. The neck of the uterus which must expand greatly during childbirth, or even the heart cells, walls, the heart cells, the muscle heart cells, when they, when the heart contracts, they must stay together, or blood fills the heart. Okay, then we've got gap junctions. These type of connections, they permit, they're actually channels between cells that they permit the passage of materials direct from the cytoplasm of one cell to the cytoplasm of an adjacent cell. In case I haven't told you what is a cytoplasm, a cytoplasm is um, the fluid inside the cell. Okay. Now, an example is heart muscle tissue. I want you to talk now, I want to talk now about intercalated discs. You know, my favorite uh, subject in medicine is the heart. So if I manage to get into an Italian medical school, I want to be either a cardiologist or a heart surgeon. That's what I want to be. So anytime we talk about the heart, I'm going to talk in much, much detail. And you can just not hear me, or you could just hear me. Some of them need, some of them you need to know, some of them you don't. For instance, I don't think you need to know intercalated discs, but I want to tell them. You see, each, um, each cell of the heart, the muscle heart cells, are connected by these intercalated discs. What are intercalated discs actually? Desmosomes, gap junctions. Desmosomes, in order not to break, 
and gap junctions in order to have the movement of ions from one cell to another. You see the heart has the pacemaker cells which do what? They make the heart pump. How they do that? They release, let's say, ions which need to go to every single heart cell in order, it's muscle heart cell, in order for it to contract. Those ions, they don't get to the uh, extracellular and then they get again inside the intracellular environmental fluid cell, but they pass in, uh, from, it, from one cell to another through the intercalated uh, discs and more specifically gap junctions. Okay, so uh, we have a quicker um, transmission of the ions in order to have the contraction. Okay, and last is the plasma desmata. Plasma desmata are these connections between plant cells, and they are like uh, they are analogous to gap junctions in animal cells. Again, okay? they occur only in plant cells. So, this is on the first part about um, the cell. In the next Part, we're going to talk about signal transduction and the next and the rest of the organelles of the cell. Thank you so much, guys.